Well, good, every, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Well, I want to uh, welcome all of you to the Lessons from the Corner Office event. Uh, I know that uh, just looking around the room that, that several of you have uh, been to uh, prior events in this series before. Uh, I will tell you that this is uh, of all of the events we do. We do um, on the order of 100 events and other programs that enable our members and investors and partners to come together. More than 100 events every single year. This series is perhaps uh, the one that I find most uh, enriching, most uh, interesting, and most helpful for me personally in terms of my professional development, my personal development, and uh, frankly, my uh, ability to develop relationships with other uh, people in Acadiana who have uh, great concern and great influence over uh, the uh, future of our area. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I also want to uh, thank Rafino's on the River for opening this beautiful space for us, uh, for the delicious food, the hands that prepared it. Um, this is something that they do special for One Acadiana. Uh, they're ordinarily not open for breakfast, but they do this for us, so I want to thank the team here at Rafino's. I also want to thank uh, J.D. Regard and the Cane River Pecan Company. Uh, J.D. and his company, Cane River Pecan, uh, early on said that uh, they wanted to support the series as, as our sponsor, and they've done that uh, for the last several events. And so before we get started, I wanted to invite uh, J.D. J.D. is, by the way, uh, not only our sponsor today, J.D. is also uh, one of One Acadiana's <coughs> board members. Uh, he has a, a company that is based in Iberia Parish uh, that, uh, that serves not only companies throughout Acadiana, but uh, throughout the state of Louisiana and uh, further afield. So, J.D., please, uh, please say a few words, if you would. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm not going to use a mic. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, we're really proud to be a part of this event. Like Jason said, it's my personal favorite event of the year. It's very rare that we get an opportunity to hear from some of our real entrenched leaders of Acadiana. And Richard Zhuslav is certainly one of those. You know, he's a, not only a, a titan here in Acadiana, but he's a titan within his industry. And uh, I'm excited about hearing his story of how he got here, how a guy from Pennsylvania made it all the way down the bayou. Um, we should also mention your home state, the Pittsburgh uh, Penguins are in the NHL Finals. Had a great uh, game last night uh, against Nashville. Uh, I don't know if you grew up watching hockey, but many years ago when I came to Lafayette, I worked for the Louisiana Ice Hockey team, the ice skaters, back in 95. And Richard and, and the Canadian Ambulance was a proud sponsor of that team. And we had the Zamboni all outfitted like an ambulance. It's probably the best looking ambulance you ever had. Um, and so it's been exciting to watch uh, Katie grow through the years and watch the diversity of their business. And it's something to be admired. So um, we're proud to be here and be a part of that, Richard. And uh, I'd love to hear about relationship building. And um, Richard's done a great job with that. Uh, he's got a fabulous duck camp down here in Louisiana. And I hope at some point Jason touches on what that camp has meant to the relationship building you've done in your industry and here in the state. At Cane River Pecan Company, we are a pecan company, we sell pecans every day, but more than that, we're a gifting company, and by being, by virtue of a gifting company, we're a relationship building company. You know, companies come to us for products to help build and maintain and strengthen corporate relationships. So we really value relationship building at our company. And we're really proud to be here, and uh, hope you enjoy the presentation, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Richard. So, so as we get started, I, th I think you'll have a chance, for those of you who don't know uh, Richard's story, for those of you who don't know uh, his biography or the story of Acadian companies, we'll, we'll tell that story uh, in Richard's words over the course of the next hour or so. So I won't do... Uh, a, a big introduction, but uh, I think uh, I think I need to raise my mic. Is that better, Jeff? So so. 
So, so is that better? Okay. So I won't do a big introduction, but um, I, I think uh, you know Richard really is somebody who, in this community, uh, needs no introduction. Um, uh, Acadian Companies has been a uh, highly visible, uh, not only growth company in, in its industry, in this economy, but has been one of the most uh, consistent and most visible uh, contributors to community leadership, uh, to supporting our state, uh, and uh, leveraging the resources of, of the company uh, for the greater good. And so as we get started this morning, um, I'd like you to just help me welcome uh, Richard Zuschlag to this table and um, share our gratitude for carving out some time for this. Thank you. So, Richard, let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, every, uh, every company has a founding story. Uh, you are one of the founders of this company and have led it over uh, 40 years or so. So uh, tell, tell us about how it got started. Uh, how did you come to Acadiana? Um, how did the company get started? Uh, and uh, and you know, get, us, get us from there to here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity, Jason. Thank you for the invitation. And JD, thank you for your sponsorship. I love Cades Macans. Um, when I met you a number of years ago, that's something I did traditionally uh, at our company, not only for our senior management spouses, but a lot of our uh, customers, particularly those from the north. I was just thinking while you were talking, a lot of the uh, vice president's wives love to uh, bake pecan pie, which is my favorite dessert. And I was thinking, what I probably ought to do is have a contest to see which one makes the best. Because every year, when I send them all those pecans, a lot of them go out of the way to make me a pecan pie. And I end up with too many pecan pies, so I have to freeze some of them. But you do a good job, and the presentation that you all do with the pecans is great. So thank you again for your uh, sponsorship. Let me just say that um, the success of Acadian Ambulance is a direct tribute to the people of Acadiana. When you find employees that have loyalty and dedication and a Christian heart, there's probably not any other place in the country that you could start a company like we did and have the kind of loyalty and goodwill and hard work that our Canadian family has provided. It has been a lot more difficult for me to provide the same expert service in Texas or Mississippi than what has been here in this region. It's hard to find people that work as hard, that are as kind-hearted with that Christian heart. Lafayette and Acadia is special because of the people. So our company has been successful because of the employees, and I'm very proud of that. I have a number of employees here today. I'm proud of all of them. This table has some of my senior management. There's not another company in the South that has senior management with 40 or more years. The company was founded September 1st, 1971. And I have eight members of the staff now with more than 40 years. So I'm at the, approaching the 47th year. There's a lot of them that are excited about me retiring when I have 50 years. Uh, I might not retire. I'm telling them I might, but I might not. I kind of like what I'm doing. I get up every day and I'm blessed because I love to go to work. And I. I think the reason I love to go to work is because I have such a great staff. So the story of how I got here, this is kind of complicated, and I'll try to do it in a shorter version. It might take a little time, but you don't mind. All right. So when I graduated from high school in 1966, I went off to Washington, D.C., to the Capital Institute of Technology to get a communications uh, engineering degree, a double E degree. And I went to school there for four years, and I was somewhat concerned about what draft number I'd end up with and whether or not I'd be drafted into the Vietnam War. And a gentleman from Westinghouse Space and Defense Center, one of the, uh, when we were seniors, when they came in to recruit you, offered me a job that provided a draft deferment at Westinghouse Space and Defense up in Baltimore. So I took that job. And after working with him in Baltimore for three months, he said, I'm going to send you either to Saudi Arabia to teach them how to run a radio communication microwave system, or I'm going to send you to Lafayette, Louisiana on a social experiment that Westinghouse wants to try out. 
I, I had never been anywhere except that little hometown of Greenville, Pennsylvania, tucked away in the Appalachian Mountains, north of Pittsburgh. I was telling JD that the first time I ever went to Pittsburgh, I was 16 years old. That 65 mile drive was a big trip for our family. I was the oldest of four. We went down to the zoo and I can remember my poor dad getting lost in Pittsburgh and we didn't spend very much time at the zoo because we were lost for about three hours. But uh, going to Washington DC was a big deal for me. I can remember riding the Greyhound bus back to Pittsburgh for holidays. And I remember my grandmother who was helping finance my schooling sending me $30 so for Christmas, the second year, I could make my first airline flight on Northwest Air Airlines from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh. I still remember that flight like it was yesterday. So when I go back and reminisce, there's a lot of things that come into detail. Arriving here in Lafayette on July 22nd, 1970, in a uh, old Skylark, it was probably about eight years old with over 100,000 miles, no air conditioning, and it was 98 degrees. I remember finding a motel room out there, Howard Johnson's on uh, Highway 90, and I kind of freaked out. It was so damn hot, and I had no air conditioning in that car, that people uh, talked funny, they, they ate very highly seasoned food, it rained around here in the monsoon rains, and it was like people were paddling to school in some kind of a canoe, a piro or something. I, I, it was a whole different culture for me. I really had a hard time adjusting the first six months I was here. And Westinghouse was losing income from the federal government because President Johnson was shifting a lot of things from the military over to social work, and I was an experiment. They were trying to get money for social pro programs, and Our Lady of Lords and Lafayette General bid on a big project, and the government gave them a bunch of money to take unemployed individuals that did not have a high school diploma and gainfully employ them at the hospitals as housekeepers, dietitian helpers, nurses' aides, and et cetera. So what I became was a high school teacher at Lourdes in general, bringing in people off the unemployment line and getting them their high school diploma or their equi equivalency. I would teach for four hours in the morning and then the hospital would teach for four hours in the afternoon. It's rather complicated because my boss's name was Richard Fusilier, and he lived in Ville Platte, Louisiana. And that's how he was able to get this grant for these two hospitals. I was a bit bored with that. I enjoyed it. There was some 150 people that I trained in a first year period down here. And I think the program was pretty successful because 90% of them end up having a good job for more than two years. But while I was bored, the hospitals would put me to work doing other projects, mainly in the public relations arena, but they had no way to legally pay me on the side. And so what they did is decided to feed me. And I had a little garage apartment over there on Bendell Road across from Lafayette General. And so they gave me the doctor number. Back then there was no cell phones, there was not, not even any pages back then. You had a doctor's number, so the switchboard would page Dr. 123 or 180, call the operator. Well, I became Dr. Zero Zero. <laughs> and so every time I'd go through the cafeteria line, I'd have to give them my doctor's number. It was Zero Zero. And when, the, when Flo would page me at Lafayette General, I'd hear those doctors go running around, who in the hell is Zero Zero? <laughs> they all thought I was a doctor. I was just a 23-year-old kid teaching high school down here. At the end of that assignment, I fell in love with Lafayette. And the person that I was reporting to was Roland Dugau, and he was the number two man at Lafayette General. And we were looking for a business for me to get into to stay. And so we were gonna do the same thing Westinghouse was doing. We were gonna call it the Evangeline Training Center. And we worked real hard on that. And while we were trying to get a license to do that, the funeral homes walked in to the police jury and laid the keys to the desk and said, because of the new standards, we're not gonna provide ambulance service, you're gonna to have to take it over. And I started thinking about when I was working my way through high school, I was 16 years old painting the outdoor of a radio station and the uh, boss got mad at the announcer and they had a fight and the guy left. He come out and got me off the ladder and said, you're gonna to have to come play radio music. So I became Dick Richards, DR the DJ at WGRP, home of the Lakeland Music Explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and in 
And sometimes I had 120 people listening to me. <laughs> it's a very small station. And uh, I became a part-time sales guy and started selling radio ads. And I can remember getting Pepsi-Cola and 7-Up to pay $7.50 for Request-O-Matic. You'd call in and request your record, and I'd record it and play it back. And that was a pretty big deal for me back then. Along that time, the little town about the size of Abbeville ended up with the funeral homes going out of business. And a gentleman from Meadville came down and opened up the Greenville Ambulance Service and sold memberships. And they asked me to go to the bank and set up a remote broadcast to explain to people what the membership bought for you. And subsequently after that, we'd have a telephone call-in program so people could understand the membership. And I'm sitting there, and the, the gentleman on the station didn't have very much money, and when you put people on the telephone live on the radio, you kind of have a delay. And I was kind of like a southern construction engineer because I set up two old-fashioned tape recorders, and I had about a 15-second delay from one machine to the other. So when I started the one-hour broadcast at the end, I was scared to death because there was about three minutes of tape on the floor. The second machine was playing it back slower than what the first machine was recording it. So people would call in on the phone and ask questions. So producing all that, I listened to how this membership program was working in Greenville. So I wrote a letter to the man that started it. He sent me all the information. And Richard Sturleys and Roland Dugal and I went to the city council. At that time, there wasn't a council. It was Ray Bertrand. There was three trustees that ran the city to try to convince them that we could provide it. And he said we were too young, and he didn't want us to do it. But the problem was that nobody would give a proposal to the, to the mayor. And we were the only ones. And they went back out for a bit again. And they went back out a bit again. I went to the mayor's office three times, and all three times he decided that we, we couldn't do it. The fourth time, I sat there from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 o'clock. When he came out of his office, what are you doing here again? I said, I'm telling you right now that nobody else can do this, but we can, and I want you to call the mayor of my hometown. At least just call and talk to him to see how it worked in that little town. And I'll never forget Ray Bertrand at 7.15 that night calling that mayor. And when he hung up, he looked at me and said, there's nobody else that wants to try it. We don't have money for the fire department to do it. I think we're going to give you a chance. So later on, when I talk about Z's peace, persistence prevailed for me. Persistence got me through. Uh, we were young. He had confidence in Roland because he knew Roland's dad from Broussard. Problem is, we didn't have any money. <laughs> didn't have any money at all. Uh, we started that company with $2,300. None of the banks would loan us money. Financed the first two ambulances at 16% through GMAC. We hired eight Vietnam medics. There were no EMTs or paramedics back then. These medics were very upset with us because they were standing on the unemployment line and they wanted their six months of free money before they went to work. They had served their country. They didn't want to come back and go to work right away. They wanted the unemployment for six months. And then they would come to work for us. But once we offered them a job and they didn't take it, they lost their, their unemployment check. They got mad. A couple of them wanted to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the success we got with those first eight Vietnam medics really inspired the medical community because Lafayette has a very progressive young medical physician group. And they were all for us. And they supported the standing orders I can remember in 1974 getting summoned to Lafayette General's Board of Directors meeting and being chewed out. You are costing the hospital too much money because your people are getting people to the hospital alive and it's taken 30 to 45 minutes for the doctor on call to come to the emergency room. Now we're being forced to hire around the clock 24 hour doctors because people are living and we're letting them die by accident in the hospital because we don't have a doctor there fast enough. I've never forgotten that meeting. And so we changed a lot of the pre-hospital care system in the South pretty quickly. And it was because of those Vietnam medics. Um, the story keeps going on and on and on, but I'll just say this. Those initial medics, and listen, I, I'm a Boy Scout guy with a first aid merit badge scared to death of medicine. 
I wasn't that good a driver. I used to get lost. Um, but I drove the ambulance for two years. And then uh, Sterling and I would pay the bills and send out uh, the membership report. And I can remember when we used to do the membership, we had those little uh, recipe cards. And we ended up with 10,000 recipe cards on the floor. You put all the A's and all the B's. There was no computers back then. And so when you called, you were a member. Back then, you didn't get a bill at all. And if you weren't a member, you paid $40 for a transfer and $90 for an emergency. I can remember how much Governor Edwards, Secretary of Health, Dr. Bill Cherry, helped me. We were struggling, and Medicaid only paid $15 back then. I went to Baton Rouge crying because we couldn't make ends meet, and Dr. Cherry just said, well, we're going to pay you your $80. Whatever your emergency charges, we're going to, I like what you're all doing, we're going to pay you the, what your bill charges are. We got in trouble later on with Medicare because he wasn't allowed to do that, but that two years that we got that Medicaid money kind of got us over the hump. Governor Edwards and, and Dr. Cherry were very helpful because they liked the quality of service we were providing. So I came across a letter from 1969 from a funeral home now that's out of business. And in the letter it said to the funeral drivers, when you get to the wreck, pick up the dead bodies and bring them back to the funeral home and let the ambulances that get there late take the live ones to the emergency room. Now think about this. They tried to do the best they could. It was a tradition from the old days when they had a horse and wagon that the only way you could take somebody laying down or in a casket was in a long wagon. So the funeral homes just got stuck with ambulance on the side. And back then, you got $2,500 for a funeral and $25 for an ambulance call. Wasn't really any reason why you'd want to stick somebody in the back to try to save a life. It was just a driver. There was nobody in the back. So if you were bleeding or you weren't breathing and there was nobody back there opening up your airway, a lot of people just didn't make it back then. So we were one of the first systems in the South to change that culture. And I think one of the reasons we have been successful is we went into this business to save lives and the money making came later. The first 25 years, our company never made very much money at all, just enough to pay the bank note, the employees, and to grow a little bit. We were blessed. I can remember Red Dumas Neal, who was the first banker that finally gave us a chance, chewing me out and saying, listen here, you're raising your rates too fast. You can't put a damn doctor in the back of every one of those ambulances. You can't afford that. And then he retired. And then he got on the board of directors of the ambulance company. And right before he retired, because now he's a board member emeritus, he sleeps through half the meetings. But he still remembers everything that's happened for 47 years. In his head, he can remember every financial transaction that we've ever had. But I'll never forget when he retired from our board of directors, him calling me into his office and saying, listen here, this teeter-totter of balancing you can't save every life, but you don't want to focus just on the stock and how much money the stock's worth. You've got to keep the teeter-totter balanced. You may be, in these recent years, are pushing too much for your employees to have a better retirement, and you're more worried about the value of the stock than you are about the quality of the patient care. That was very eye-opening to me, and I think that my outside board members and my executive committee have done an excellent job of trying to balance this equation of doing what is right for patient care and also to make sure that we're providing the right retirement for our employees. So I'm excited about where our company is and I get very emotional when I talk about the employees and the dedication and the loyalty. The loyalty means a great deal to our company. The employees are very loyal to me and I feel I'm very loyal to them. Hence, in the recent years when there's been lots of money offered to buy out this company, in the last 18 months I've made a decision that we're not going to sell it to a big corporate company. Uh, hopefully in the next few years, the last 20% of the company that my family retains will be sold to the employee trust and I'll leave a legacy of an ambulance company that gives back to the community and the employees will own 100% of it and they'll run the future of the company. So, thinking back, 
to, to those early days. A lot of the story you just told was in the late 60s, early 1970s. Where did you think this was all going back then? And what were some of the major milestones that gave the Acadian companies the shape that it has today? Lots of people spent a lot of time sitting around planning. Unfortunately, we didn't do much planning in the beginning. I worked very hard through the Duck Lodge to convince South Central Bell to provide 911 service. Lafayette is the first community in the state to obtain 911 enhanced service, giving us the street address and the telephone number. And I'm proud of that fact. I worked really hard with the community and uh, Representative LeBlanc, not the uh, LeBlanc that helps run the university, but his daddy. He passed the bill for us, and we were able to pass a telephone tax here in Lafayette that assessed each residential phone 50 cents a month and each commercial line $2 a month. And that money was used to build the Lafayette Parish 911 center. That saved a lot of lives. But I'll say this. When somebody called 911, we jumped in the ambulance and went and got them and got them to the right hospital. We didn't spend very much time sitting around planning. P perhaps we should have. The initial goal was to provide a great ambulance service for Lafayette Parish. We didn't have any ambition or any idea that we'd grow beyond Lafayette. Because the doctors were so supportive of us, word just started getting around everywhere how many people were being saved that used to die. And other parishes wanted us to come. And it was very difficult for us to go into those parishes because we didn't have any money. And we had a hard time getting the banks to finance us. Uh, the old Guarantee Bank did a lot to help us. And in today's environment, bankers wouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, I can remember uh, driving the ambulance to Shreveport and getting a flat tire. And there was not enough room back then to have a spare in the ambulance. And I didn't have any money. And I couldn't get back from Shreveport to Lafayette. And I had to call Mr. Dumasnil. And he got mad at me. He said, well, why don't you have a credit card? Well, sir, uh, I tried to get one a couple times at your bank, and they won't give me credit. <laughs> and so he wired me the money, and I got my tire. I got back to Lafayette, and I went to see him. And back then, he didn't have a Visa card. It was a Bank of America card. And he co-signed my card at, at the bank using his personal credit to give me a $400 credit line. I think a banker today would go to jail if they did something like that. I mean, he did things like that. And, and so I think at one point, I'd gotten up to maybe 10 ambulances. And I had a, a I wasn't allowed to borrow more than a million and a half dollars. And somehow I, I borrowed a million dollars over my line. And he didn't know it. He wasn't paying attention. I got in a lot of trouble about that. But and, and this is another funny story. My chief financial officer, David Kelly, who, worked, who used to work for Ernest & Young 25 years ago, back then he was the, doing the audit on the bank. <laughs> And Mr. Dumasil got written up, I found out about this later, because he was given 100% financing to my company, 100%. He got in all kinds of trouble over that. And so I can remember uh, 10 years later, now David Kelly's working for me, and we're sitting there arguing about the interest rate, and Mr. Dumasil took those glasses, and listen here, and fussed at us, and I think we had to give in to one eighth of a point on that. But I'll, I'll just say, I was blessed to be in Lafayette because the hospitals, the doctors, the people, the bankers, the media. When we first started, Ray Birch was only four banks. Ray Birch says, what do you mean the banks have to sell your memberships? We can't collect all that money. The banks have to sell the memberships. He got the four bank presidents, and none of them wanted to do that. Well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Well, he got them all to open up a checking account. And so during the membership time, it was $15, and you'd go to the bank, and Give them your money. And people kind of thought, well, if the bank's collecting the money, they must be legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> so I can still remember when Bank One bought out uh, the Premier Bank, and then risk management people from Ohio came down, we're not going to sell those memberships. If somebody gets killed one of them ambulances, we're going to be liable. And I can remember how the people with the Premier Bank 
overturned Bank One people, and Bank One ended up selling the memberships. I have some old banker down in St. Martin, I can't remember his name. He gets so upset about all that advertising we do that on Friday night, the deadline, you know, if we were selling, like, let's say, at, at the peak of our membership campaign in the 90s, we would sell 140,000 memberships, raise, you know, 12, 13 million dollars. Half of that came in the last three days. It's like income tax. Everybody waited. So on Friday night at 6, those banks would not close till 7.30 because of the lines of people waiting. And that banker down in uh, state, he called and said, we're not doing it. I said, well, how are we going to run an ad? Go to any bank except the Chess Bank or whatever the name of that bank was. So he made me set up an ambulance and a table out in front of the bank to help his people take the memberships on Friday night. But the banks were good to us, and that was a great collection vehicle to be able to bring in all that cash and see we had a problem. We were using that membership money as capital. And then every year we'd mail the membership out one week early, then two weeks early, and so we'd mail a month early. We had to get a bridge account and go from one year to the next year because we never had enough cash. The banks were good, the hospitals were good, Acadiana was good. I dare say it'd be difficult to start a business like this in other parts of this country. We were at the right place at the right time with some good luck, and we had a mission and a cause to save people's lives. And then in um, 93, we did a small ESOP transaction with 30% of the company, and that was the beginning of a new program for us. I might as well go right into this right now. In 98, I had the two best partners you could ever ask for, Roland Dugan and Richard Sterling's Christian men. The three of us, 95% of the time, always agreed on everything. And if we couldn't agree, we would delay things for a couple of months until we could build consensus and agree, because we very seldom ever did anything but two people yes and one no. But there was a big company in Boston getting started up, going public, and they offered us a lot of money. And they outvoted me. Uh, 40% for Roland, 20% for Sterling's. I had 40%, so I lost. And I cried. It was an emotional time for me. And when the head man from Boston came down to finalize the transaction and found out I wasn't going to go with the transaction, he called off the sale. And it really upset my two partners. And that was the first major squabble we had. And that's kind of how the real big ESOP got taken over. In other words, it took us six months to unravel all that, but they finally were able to sell their interest to the trust. And because of Russell Long's ESOP legislation, they didn't have to pay any capital gains on that as long as they invested it in other U.S. securities within 12 months. So they didn't get as much money as they could have, but they almost cut it, and we parted friends. They had older families. They were scared to death of Medicare changes. They had worked their tail off to get to where they were at, and they wanted to cash out. And in the end, it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to us because this employee trust that oversees the 80% ESOP really benefits our employees. And we have paid out over $150 million of stock to employees who have left us or retired and there's another $250 million sitting in their stock accounts now for those employees that are still working with us. So we've created a nice retirement program for our employees. And the way it basically works is an employee puts up 4% of their annual pay in their 401k and manages that themselves. And depending on the profitability of the company, the company puts up between 8 and 15% of their salary in company stock. And after a five year clifting period, if they leave the company, they can take that money with them and roll it into an IRA and use it for their next retirement. So it's worked out really well for us. Before Russell Long died, he told me out of all the companies, we used it for the right purpose, for the right reason, to make sure that we were watching out for the best interests of our employees. And I think, to a large extent, that has helped continue to attract some of the best talent that a company could have in the various divisions that we have. Because employees do have a say. They do have involvement. They give a lot of recommendations. But more importantly, and I like to tell this little antidote, 
One of the big doctors was down here doing accreditation, and I want you all to know when you go through these accreditation processes, it's expensive, it's time consuming, but it makes us a better company. And he was in Dallas interviewing a medic that had been working for us for 18 months. He asked this medic, have you met the owner of the company? Yep, you're looking at him. <laughs> doctor, doctor said, what do you mean? I own a part of this company. I'm a member of the company's ESOP. So I think about 80% of the employees like that ESOP. There's always some that would rather have more money now and not wait for retirement. But those employees that are members of the ESOP conscientiously go out of their way to find ways to be more efficient, to save more money, and to be better at patient care. When I look back on the old days and some of the fast growth periods where we were not properly managed, where we hadn't trained all of our management or found all the right people yet, and I look at the number of complaints we'd get on a daily basis, it's gone way down. We transport 2,000 patients a day. And while we have all these other great divisions, ATS here right now, Acadian Total Security, they're growing pretty fast, particularly in this Acadiana area with all their new technology. The bread and butter, 70% of the company is still the ground ambulance service. And um, out of the 2,000 patients we transport, the number of complaints have gone way down. Now, we still get them, but, but we try very hard not to make the same dumb mistake twice. And if there's one thing that the management does not like, I am operations centered, and I got eyes out the back of my head, and I get all kinds of reports coming into me every morning. And so when there is an operational glitch, I'm going to spend a lot of time getting to the bottom of it. I like to get into details. I'm a damn Yankee that really gets wound up about this kind of stuff. I like to tell people that it took a damn Yankee to come south to organize all you southern Cajuns. <laughs> and he's not here today, but my close friend, Errol Babineau, who helped me start our air services, likes to get up on the chair and say, and us Cajuns made you some money. And there's some truth, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. So Richard, while we're uh, talking about the staff and the ESOP, I'd like to turn the conversation to culture, uh, and particularly the culture of Acadian. There are whole books that have been written on developing a strong corporate culture. So how would you describe the culture of Acadian, and how did, how did it evolve? What, what do you do to create and sustain the culture of the Acadian companies? Well, we try real hard to get our management to pay more attention to the family and not just the matrix and statistics that we measure. You know, I'm, a, I'm somebody that learned some time ago that the more we measure, the better we get. Sometimes I measure the wrong things, so my management has to get me redirected. And I, and I tell you, I feel pretty comfortable, and I'm going to share this story. I was after a $10 million contract at Oshner's Hospital in the early 2000s, and Dr. Pat Quinlan was the CEO, and he and I became very, he, he's retired now, very close friends. He wouldn't give me that contract unless I'd get a CEO coach. And I want to tell you something. I'm too old to change. I did not want a CEO coach. Who, who can come coach me and try to change? I'm kind of hard-headed. <laughs> well... After about six months, he wouldn't get me the contract. I finally got a CEO coach. And I want to tell you something. It taught me a lesson that we're never too old to learn new things. And that guy changed me for the good. But more importantly, he helped take delicate matters between me and my senior management staff and was a translator. And he brought us closer together on things that they weren't comfortable talking to me about or things I wasn't comfortable talking to them about, we are all a lot more open. We like to have a lot of fellowship and tease and just. But when we have a big problem, we have meaningful discussion and we try to find out how to build consensus. Now, that takes more time and patience and when it comes to those P's I talk about, patience is not something I got. My wife's been working on trying to get me to have more patience, and so I am trying to work on that. If you take more time and work on consensus building, the decision is better. I think that probably sometimes when I have a knee-jerk reaction, I make the decision by myself, 
I'm sometimes wrong, but if I can get that executive committee of six and they make the decision, even if it's five to one, it's much better than just one person or 12 or 15. You get 12 or 15 people, they all mean well, but you're going to stay spinning around for a long time before you can get the thing moving forward. Our culture of giving back to the community is something that we teach. Our culture about improving family life. Our culture about putting the patient first. Patient first. Doing the right thing medically. You know, when the old lady in Henderson calls me up and says, your damn medics come out here to get my husband, and they were in a hurry to get him out, and they smashed my screen door. Well, what was wrong with him? Well, he was having a heart attack. Well, is he doing okay? Yeah, they saved his life, but they broke the screen door. <laughs> we go fix the screen door. That's just the way our company is. We make sure that we do the right thing with the patient. And let me tell you something. I believe when we're wrong, when we make a mistake, lots of times when we go out and make things right by the patient, we end up avoiding a lawsuit. That's Acadiana. You go to New Orleans or someplace in Texas, and the first thing they do is sue you. When we go out and make peace with the people in Acadiana and do the right thing to take care of them, oftentimes they don't follow suit. I was looking over the last five months. First five months of this year, we've had the least number of lawsuits ever filed. I'm so excited. <laughs> Those darn lawyers cause me a lot of headaches. But uh, in terms of culture, I think that original group, the way we were all guided and taught to give back to the community, some of that, I think, came from my parents. My daddy was a very, very hard worker. He had a couple of jobs. I know that in high school, I had three or four jobs. I delivered newspapers. I was Dick Richards at the radio station. I uh, bagged groceries. I did a lot of different things. But that radio station experience of listening to that guy sell memberships and then getting a chance to sell radio advertising time all contributed to me in a great way to help come down here and be able to share some of that with, with our employees. And while I have many character defaults, as the CEO coach pointed out to me, <laughs> my, one, my one attribute is, Give me an hour with somebody, and I can tell whether or not they're going to fit into the culture of Acadian Ambulance or not. Uh, they get all these new psych psychiatry-type tests that you take to find out the employee is going to be right or not. I don't need all that. I can sit and visit and figure out if they're going to fit in or not. And we, we've made a few mistakes along the way, but by and far, our group of management is worried about making sure that all of the employees and management rise together and there's no one individual that needs to be rising higher than the rest of the group. And so that culture has worked very well in our organization. I also think when you see people doing as well as what they've done in job satisfaction and financially, it, it's attracting other people who want to be a part of that kind of a team. And I'm proud of that. It's amazing to me the number of individuals throughout the country, and in particularly uh, in Louisiana, have come to me and asked for senior jobs. And I am one that believes I should promote from within. I have worked really hard on people going back to college and getting more education and promoting from within, except when it comes to some expertise like a physician, although I wished I would have done a better job of tracking how many medics have become physicians. But in 47 years, it's between 75 and 100 that have gone on to become physicians. And I'm very proud of that fact. Um, the relationship that we have de developed here with the community college is wonderful. Dr. Ottoman made a big decision to help us way back. UL has one of the best nursing programs in the country. He pushed them against their will to develop a two-year associate degree in uh, emergency health services to get a paramedic license, and that worked out wonderful. They did the best job that's ever been done. Then it, it got taken away from the university. They weren't allowed to do two-year degrees, and the trade school took it over, and it kind of flopped. Now that the community, community college system's come about, they're very good, and we have partnered. And that's the only way we're existing right now. Our biggest 
challenge is trained EMTs and paramedics. We can't find enough. We're giving $10,000 bonuses, $15,000 bonuses, bringing them in from other states. The problem is this. It takes 18 months to get a paramedic trained. There's a lot of medicine, and it takes above average intelligence to grasp all that. It's not just like a three or four week program. Even the EMT program, which you need to be to drive the ambulance, has gotten up to, I think, 18, 20 weeks. And um, the community college system does well at that, but it's a long period of time of training. And in places like Lake Charles, if you have medics, our EMTs start out around $32,000. The paramedics start out around forty two. dollars But after they've been with us for 10 years, they can make fifty dollars to 55000 You go over to Lake Charles, and all of a sudden, those big companies that are moving in over there will take a paramedic that's making 55000 and pay them seventy dollars or $75,000 to drive a truck from 8 until 5, Monday through Friday. They don't got to work at night, they don't got to work on weekends. And being a paramedic and working on holidays and around the clock takes a special individual that likes to serve people and likes to have a lot of adrenaline on all these emergencies. It also can be a very stressful job. When you're saving somebody's life and you're stuck upside down in a ditch with 15 firemen and policemen and bystanders and somebody's trapped and dying, it's very stressful working, and you have a lot of successes, but you have a lot of failures, and that caused a lot of emotional problems for our staff. It's more difficult than what a lot of people realize. So you talked earlier about the executive committee, a team of six, uh, a group that, as I understand it, uh, makes many of the big decisions yes. in consultation with the board. So. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how the group of leaders at Acadian uh, make decisions. How, 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 does that, how does that work culturally? What are some of the big things that you consider typically? What's, what's the process like? You've, you've made some big bets over the years. Uh, you've diversified the company. Uh, it's no longer just uh, even a large ambulance company. It's a company that does a lot of different things. So um, how, how did you go about making some of those big decisions and what, what's worked along the way, what, what hasn't worked? We take a lot of the information from each one of the divisions. So each one of the divisions has their set of goals. So they, they go away for a couple of days and, and usually have a third party administrator help lead them through their challenges. And they come back and make recommendations. And we take the recommendations from each one of the divisions at the executive level and we make our recommendations and then we have two wonderful outside board members that meet with us on a monthly basis and um, they're very good at helping guide us through some of these acquisitions and some of these expansions. Uh, we've made a few mistakes along the way. Because we are employee owned, we're not as risk as we used to be when it comes to acquisitions, we're more cautious. We'd, we've been challenged a lot to acquire companies in the 75 to $100 million range. We're a $500 million company. I'm, my group, particularly me, is nervous about that. We do better at the 10 to $25 million acquisitions because if we make a mistake, it's not going to come back and haunt us and bring the price of our stock down. We have a third party that uh, the trustee works with the board of directors that comes in, in this case, it's Duffin Phelps out of Chicago, that comes in every year and determines the value of the stock because it's not publicly traded. There's a lot of subjectivity into that. It's complex. But I'm proud to say that for 25 years, the increase in stock in our company has been 14% per year for 25 years. Some years it was zero, some years it was 20 but the average is 14%. There's very few companies that can do that. Uh, we've been fortunate not to have it ever go negative. We've worked very hard at that. And so we're trying to be very prudent in our financial decisions not to make too many big gambles or be risky because the sure thing that would cause a panic among the employees is if we had a negative stock value for a couple of years because a lot of the senior management and the top, say, 150 people have vested accounts with ESOP 
and other retirement vehicles, and so a negative value would affect their retirement pretty quick. We don't want to have something like that happen. We're not a publicly held company, but we have employees as stockholders, so we operate like a public company in many ways to where the perks of the executives and managers are all put in writing and contracts are signed so that everything is done um, similar to a public company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got about another uh, 15 minutes of kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for our last 15 minutes, from starting around 9.45, uh, we're going to turn it over to you guys to, to ask some questions. So uh, if you have some, qu some questions, start you know, maybe writing them down or thinking about it, because um, I, I do want to make sure that we, we get some of that time in. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, leadership. Um, we've got a lot of younger managers with us today. Um, thinking back uh, over the course of your career, what, what sort of advice would you give to the 20-something or 30-something Richard Zuschlag. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you learned the hard way? Well, I was driven a little too much by hard work and long hours. And I realize now that it's just as important to have time off and be with family. So I'm much more supportive of people taking time off to be with their little league children or other family functions. I think I made a mistake those first 20 years we didn't make very much money at all. We barely could pay our bank notes. I can remember in 88, during the big oil crisis, of not being able to make payroll, and it was one of the most difficult weeks of my life. And I ended up on the, and I'll get emotional, front porch of Red Dumas Neal's house at 10 o'clock at night, begging for 1.8 million. I'd gone over the line, and I had to get that payroll in before midnight for the Friday payroll. And he had told me no twice that day, and he put the money in that night at 10.30. That was a difficult deal. I went to Baton Rouge the next week and got that Dr. Cherry and Governor Edwards to get the Medicaid people that were taking too many months to pay us the money, and the Medicare people to get me a check the next week to get back on track. And I had to start paying more attention to that. I, I think it's important to have a balance between work and family, and I'm more supportive now of people being off for family leave and family time. And some of that's come with me having my own children, because those first um, several years, I think I lived, we had an old office over there at Midway Street by Mrs. Jacobs' restaurant at Four Corners. For the first six months, we all slept on sleeping bags. We had no beds. We had uh, two telephones. In the daytime, there'd be a fist fight to answer the darn phone because it would be an emergency. Excuse me. In the daytime, nobody would answer the phone. They'd all go hide in the bathroom because it would be somebody from a nursing home with a bedpan that you had to take somewhere. But at night when the phone would ring, it'd be an emergency. So it'd be a fist fight to see who could answer the phone first because if you answered the phone, you got to go on the call. It's hard to get these medics to understand that the way we're more efficient than other ambulance companies if we do both emergencies and non-emergencies. Whereas if you work for a fire department or a public system, all they do is the 911 calls. So we have a better unit hour utilization because we might do three emergencies and four non-emergencies in a 12-hour shift. But to come back to, to, to some, some of the things, the other thing besides uh, using all of your measurements of matrixes that make you successful in quality and financial. I think that the biggest problem I'm having right now is getting my junior supervisors and managers to start paying attention to the families and the needs of the family. They're no longer working for me. They're working for their supervisor and the supervisor has to be connected to them in an emotional way, not just at work. Some of the fellowship of those first 20 years of the top management, we all were in each other's weddings. We all were a part of a fraternity. Of the first 20 years, we didn't have any females because none of the females came to work. That came later. Now I have Allison Farr on our executive committee. She's in our in-house legal counsel and government relations. She's a tough lady. She's married to a, a lawyer in town. His nickname's Tiger. Well, she's kind of a tiger herself, and I have uh, a lot of respect to how she stands up to us. 
But at the same time, she's a big part of our team. She's a good advisor. She wants us to make the right decisions for all concerned. And the, the one thing that I would also suggest, and this is something that was a learning lesson for me. Some of you may have heard of the Emergogenics program, where you take the exams and you find out what part of your brain is organizational, what part is artsy, what part is culture, what part is logistics. When I got into that 25, 30 years ago, that really opened up my mind to the fact that I no longer want to surround myself with people that think just like I do. That's not good. I got to have different opinions, different parts of the brain in part of the, the mix so that we have a more balanced approach to things. And that, I think, has given us a smoother ride. I think our decisions are better than what they used to be. If we have a vote at the executive committee where it might be four to two. We might do some thinking before we move forward. We might delay the decision. We really try hard to build consensus. I think young people that are managing have to do two things. Spend more time with their employees and get to know them personally. We have one department that does a great job of having the employees take a vote on what charities they want to be involved in and uses the fundraising at the charity as community building for that department. The other thing is that I think they need to spend more time with customers. We, we need to go out and talk to the patients and visit with them and see what they liked about us and what they didn't. And I'm trying to get more of my senior management that just loves to sit at their desk and get out into the field. If, if we can get more people in the field to deal with employees, and patients and customers is better for us. And it's a hard thing to do when there's so many other things that need to be done. We're all too consumed with our email and our computers. We can no longer do all of our communications that way. We gotta talk to them on the phone or go see them in person. And that takes extra time and extra effort, but it pays big dividends. So uh, one, of, one of the things that is characteristic of Acadian companies is you have uh, extensive and sustained and passionate engagement uh, in the communities you serve. Um, you've also cultivated uh, significant relationships with uh, national leaders. Um, so in other words, you've, you've met some extraordinary people over the years. You've uh, uh, including people who have had a hand in leading our country. And I'm interested in a couple things. This might be a good time to talk about the duck camp as well. But in, in particular, I'm interested in two things. One is, are there, are there any individual leaders that have had um, significant impact on your own professional or personal development, beyond the CEO coach. So people who have had a big impact on you personally. Um, the other thing I'm wondering is, as you've gotten to know some of our, uh, some of the top leaders in uh, business, in, uh, in the public sector, are there any themes that you would pick out that are um, you know, consistent in, in their success? You know, um, somebody that I got really close to was uh, George H. Bush. That is a gentleman that I have the utmost respect for his civic service to our country. And it's interesting how this happened. You know, um, they came to me to raise money for the trip that Cardinal Pialaghi made to come to Lafayette. Katie had never had a visiting cardinal. And he was the apostolic nuncio up in Washington, D.C. And he promised after he retired to somebody else that he'd come to Acadiana, and then they came to me to raise money. And Acadiana opened up the red carpet, and he went to all kinds of churches in a 10-day visit. And I was part of the circle that raised the money, and he asked me at dinner one night. I was in charge of getting him back to Houston to catch a commercial flight back to Rome. And he said to me, um, could you get an appointment with me with President Bush over at Texas A&M at his library? so that we could go visit him that morning before I catch my flight. I said, well, how am I going to do that? So <laughs> I called over there and talked to the secretary and told her who I had with me. And it turned out that while he was apostolic nuncio, 
he and George H. Bush played tennis. The, his house was right across the street from the vice president's house. They played tennis every week. And when George H. became president, the first thing he did was put that cardinal on his plane and go to a Notre Dame football game. And they became the best of friends. So here I am calling, and next thing I know, she calls back and says, yes, he'll see you and the cardinal at 11 a.m. I didn't have any planes back then. I called my friend, Mrs. Suggs, who was chairman of PHI, and she gave me her jet because she was also on the committee. So I flew him over to uh, Bush's library, and that's the first time I had ever met the president. And um, he had uh, Julie Eisenhower downstairs with 2,000 people. And so what he was doing is he was entertaining us in his apartment upstairs, and he'd go down the back stairs and introduce people and then come back up and have lunch and go back downstairs. It's kind of amazing how that was going. And so there was just the three of us. And it lasted two and a half hours, and I was a bit, you know, I like to talk, but I was kind of quiet. I'm like a church mouse. These two world leaders were talking about the Gulf War and the unstable dictators in South America for, since 1910. And to listen to the two of them talk and for uh, Bush to say, now which one of those cardinals in, in Rome was against the Gulf War? Wh which one was giving me the hard time? I mean, and then when they got ready to leave, uh, Bush asked the Colonel, now, my son's coming over there in Thanksgiving. Can you make sure now he gets a chance to see the Pope? <laughs> so I got a chance to listen to all that. That was my beginning relationship with George H. And he took me and my parents on a 45-minute personal tour of that library when it was closed. And the things he showed me, and I made a copy of a couple of them, he's just a very dedicated person to this country. And I learned a lot from him. And when he came to speak at our paramedic luncheon, and I was flying him back in our plane to Texas, he said, what happened to Cameron Parrish? What's happening to Vermillion Parrish? I said, I don't know how to explain this to you, but everybody's raising money for Katrina, and they have forgotten about the rural parishes. And I got a little bit emotional. He formed a committee. He put me on the committee with Bill Clinton, and they raised a lot of money that came back into Vermillion and Cameron Parish, and also Galveston and, and uh, Port Arthur and some of those places, because a lot of the rural areas weren't properly helped like the people were for Katrina. He didn't want any of the money to go back down there. And so we just started communicating, and I got on his library advisory board, and just one thing led to another. So he's had a pretty big influence on me because of giving back to the communities and his servant leadership. He talks a lot about that, and I learned a lot from him. Um, I got to go with him up to his place in Kenny Bunkport, and I got to meet a lot of world leaders, and he brought me to a lot of different things and opened up my, my eyes to a lot of things. I mean, from there then, I got connected to uh, Dick Cheney f through Senator Bro, and he's been a hunting companion for the last 12 years, 14 years. He's a very nice person. He's been maligned by the press. You might not agree 100% with everything, but he is such a nice person and goes out of his way to be so nice. Um, that's been a very good experience for me. More importantly, more recently, he brought Secretary James Baker to the Duck Lodge. This guy's 84 years old. He's passionate about our government. He served three different presidents. But in the duck blind on a slow morning, he spent two hours telling me about how Russell Long went to Reagan and said, listen, if you help me get this ESOP legislation passed, I'll get you the five Democratic votes you need for your tax reform. And those were the days when Russell drank, and he would go over to the White House at 9 o'clock at night with James Baker, who was Secretary of Treasury, and start drinking with Reagan. And they'd sit up to 1 o'clock in the morning writing this ESOP legislation. That man knows more about the ESOP legislation than anybody else in the country, and I'm trying to get it on video because it's just interesting to see in a more civil time how they horse traded up there. In other words, Russell was chairman of the Finance Committee. He got his ESOP law that he was passionate about. And by the way, there's only 14,000 ESOPs in the country. We need to have more companies think about that because it's good to allow the employees to enhance their retirement and have some say in the company. I think there will be more companies that look at ESOPs. 
but listening to all that was very profound to me to see how much dedication. But, but it, it, 30 years ago, people did a better job of compromising. Now everybody just fights up there. We don't, we're not getting anywhere. It's very frustrating right now. I wish we could go back 30 years where people like John Bro and Trent Lott lived across from each other and their godfathers to each other's sons and they would bring both sides together and get things done. And, and you know, listening to somebody like James Baker is a um, very, very special experience. You just, you know, and this is another thing. He was a Democrat playing tennis with George H. Bush and George H. Bush convinced him to become a Republican to help him get elected governor of Texas. A lot of, lot. The other thing that I get a kick out of is that when Dick Cheney ran, ran for Congress, 28 years old in Wyoming, this is one congressman, the hardest vote he had to get that year was his daddy, because his daddy was a diehard Democrat. So it's just interesting how things change and go around. I think being able to network with people like that opens up more doors for business. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there were some pretty big problems our company was having with Medicare that we had big Democratic support, but not the Republican support, and Dick Cheney fixed that for me, and it's still working today, and that's a big um, plus for our company in Medicare reimbursement. Now, my chief financial officer is a tightwad, <laughs> and I'm glad I have him because maybe I would spend too much money. He keeps the collar around me. And he doesn't like the expenses of that duck lodge, but after Dick Cheney took care of that, it's okay for us to go to the duck lodge and spend money now. <laughs> and he, Dick Cheney did something that no lobbyist could have ever done. And so the duck lodge, you know, and I'm a social hunter. You know, I can remember the, the first, first, first time, we had an old shack. It was worth about $10,000. And uh, back in the late 70s, I think we probably spent $25,000, which is a lot of money then, painting it and fixing it up and putting some indoor plumbing. And uh, we, did that, we did that because Ron Guidry wanted to bring the New York press down after he got that Cy Young Award. And I can remember getting to know Ron and how much he loved the hot ducks. And the second year he came, he told me the reason I was a bad shot is I'm left-handed and if I'd have a left-handed shotgun, I might do better. And Remington had given him four guns, and he went in the back of his, because he's left-handed, went in the back of his car and gave me a brand new shotgun. And all of a sudden, you could shoot, and instead of the shell coming out and hitting me in the face, it came out the other way. <laughs> and since I, did, I wouldn't get hit in the face anymore, I got to be a little bit better at it. So the, the Duck Lodge has just evolved through the years. When Rita smashed it away, I was pretty distraught, and I was blessed two years later to find the lodge that we have now, and the family now owns it, leases it back to the company. But it's been a very good experience for my family and my grandchildren. But it's also been an attraction to hospital CEOs, physicians, district attorneys, sheriffs, governors, senators, et cetera, et cetera. And I like engaging politicians and government officials because I'm very dependent on Medicare and Medicaid money. And so I have to be bipartisan a lot of the times and work with both groups. And I like to bring people together and compromise. I, I do that in my company. I like to find ways to bring people together and compromise. I don't like big protracted fights. I'm just not that kind of person. There's got to be a way to compromise and move things forward. And that's something I enjoy doing and I'm not always successful at it. But the times I am, I'm grateful. Well, I think at this point you can see why we wanted Richard Zuschlag to, uh, to join us for uh, the lessons from the corner office. Um, uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, having this kind of dialogue with Richard many times, and it's hard to, it's hard to stop asking my questions, but I want to be fair to, um, uh, to the spirit of this. So um, why don't Before we yeah. do that, I just want to congratulate you because... We're a little late to the table on getting one Acadiana to bring the regional concept to this area. We're very provincial in this area and everybody likes their own territory. But the only way the economy in this Acadiana area is going to move forward is under one Acadiana's leadership and you, Jason, 
to get all of our parishes together to realize that when Lafayette has a win, it helps the rural parishes, and when Broadbridge or Jennings or Abbeville or New Iberia has a win, it helps Lafayette. When you go back and look at data, the SMA for Lafayette used to be just Lafayette and St. Martin Parish. A lot of them big retail stores that have opened up recently didn't see the market of 550 to 650,000 people within a 15 mile radius. We all see that on the weekends when they all come to town to shop. <laughs> and I'm just saying that trying to be able to have better site ready industries to let us have diversification from oil and gas and from health. You know, this, this is a bigger healthcare market than people realize. For some reason, the, the government calls us a transportation company. They don't call us a healthcare organization. But when you take uh, LHC and Schumacher and Acadian and then the hospitals and all these new clinics, the healthcare economy of this area has gotten to be pretty darn big. And they've all gotten a lot better at what they're doing. And there's a lot less patients leaving here to go to New Orleans or Houston. There's still plenty, but not as many as used to be because they're able to take care of them here locally. And that's good for our economy. So we're blessed to have your leadership in one Acadia begin this difficult task. You know, there's a lot of things that we could be more efficient at. Just think, down in Florida they're starting to do this, but we have a hard time getting the country sheriffs to think about this. But if we put one 911 center in Lafayette for the five or six parishes, you could save five million dollars a year and have the same efficiency, except some of them would be giving up their authority over how things are dispatched. In other words, we, we, we've got to, nonprofits have got to start to consolidate. The banking industry's consolidating. All kinds of companies, are, our company's consolidating. We are trying to be more efficient as we expand and not add the expense of management, but do it with our ground people. I just want to compliment One Acadia and what they're doing. It's a challenge, but we're beginning to make progress, and I thank you for your leadership. Thank you. So let me, let me turn it over to you guys. Uh, any, any initial questions? Yes, sir. What do you do to integrate the talent that you recruit to ADNN? Well, in many cases, we promote from within. So they already, in many cases, have had the opportunity to have the culture and the understanding, and they have been vetted by a lot of our senior management. There was a day and time, and they used to laugh at me, but there was a day and time because I'm such a detailed, uh, concise person and very communications oriented. I had more non-standard arrangements with the old telephone company when they used to be regulated. They used to hate me. I had all kinds of unstandard arrangements to make us more efficient. And when that Hurricane Katrina came through, I had a backup to the backup to the backup, and I was the only one they could talk to people inside the Cajun the Superdome. And I actually had to fly over to Baton Rouge and give the governor my walkie-talkie so she could talk to the state police because they were writing notes on tablet paper and driving it to the governor's mansion like the old Pony Express days. So I'm a communications person. But coming back to your question, they're pretty much already orientated and they get promoted from within the organization. Now, when you bring somebody in from the outside, the executive committee at the high level usually will have a committee of two or three people that vet that person out and bring them in and put them through a proper orientation channel. But there's a lot of discussion ahead of time about what they need to do to uh, be a part of the management team. We also have an in-house program where we're vetting some of our senior management to go into the executive ranks, and that's an ongoing program where they uh, somewhat, somewhat uh, are assigned to each one of the executives for a two or three month period. And then the group gets together and votes which ones we want to try out in the next position. So that, that's an effective mentoring program? Yes, simply that's what that is. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, so I thank you for uh, what you do with the community. I retired from the Army and know the skills of the medics there, and you mentioned that earlier on with the uh, Vietnam vets. Uh, what does McKinney do to reach out with the shortage of EMTs and paramedics? You maybe out, reach out to the military. 
we have a, an aggressive recruiting program for veterans right now, and we've worked with the governor both here in Louisiana and Texas to shorten up the time for them to get reciprocity. And we're trying to get places like up here in Fort Polk to let the medics come out already uh, nationally registered as paramedics. That opens up the door a lot more. Another program that's been very successful is getting the high schools, and we're out working all across the state, but we got started here at Lafayette High with their health academy, getting high schools to allow seniors to become EMTs before they graduate. That is one of the best things we have going on. What happens is when we recruit people from up north or other parts of the country, most of them only stay two or three years and then go back. I'm the exception. I like it down here. <laughs> Although I have some people in my organization who like to see me go back north. <laughs> That's a little joke among a couple of them. Um, so I think the thing, the thing I say about the EMT program, if you're out in Kentwood or a meet and you get something like that going, then you can fill the slot out in that local area and they're comfortable staying in that town. It's really hard, for example, right now, for me to get medics in Homa or Lafayette. We have, I guess you all probably know the reason why, we have a standing list of people trying to come back and work in Lafayette. They all want to come here. Where we're having a difficulty getting employees is Lake Charles because of all the industry and the competition and wages. We've had some problems down the Homa area because of some of the offshore facilities. And we've had some, um, some problems in New Orleans. New Orleans is a very, very hard market um, to get employees to stay put. And it's um, because the culture in New Orleans is not the same as it is back up here. And I'll tell you, the real problem is getting people to go over to Texas. I mean, we got some really good people in Texas. And I have to be careful where I say this at. But the reason that Texas operation is running so good right now is the number one and two position in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston, all 10 of them are Lafayette residents. And they're doing a really good job. And they're getting those people to think more like we do back here. Other questions? What would you write in a letter to yourself today, once you know the young Dave Richards or that person back then? You know, um, I, I think one of my successes that I'd like to share is that uh, no one person knows everything. And when I first got started, Max Constantine was running an ambulance service in Baton Rouge that wasn't the most efficient, but he sold school buses and funeral coaches and got into the ambulance business by accident. He was a, an accountant, but he was a very nice man. And when Roland Dugan and I went to tell him that we were getting the permit to start in Lafayette and we couldn't figure out how much it was going to cost to run, he took a napkin at the McDonald's across the street on Florida Boulevard by Baton Rouge General, the old campus, and he wrote down the budget for the first two years, first year with two ambulances, and there was $186,500. And he showed us the labor and how to pay the employees and the complicated schedules for those two ambulances. At the end of that year, he was only off by $400. I couldn't believe that. We followed his plan. What I'm trying to say is from there, I went to the fire chief in Houston. And he showed me some things about the ambulances I didn't know. Then I went to the fire chief in Dallas. And then I went to a private operator over in Miami. And I took all these people's ideas and put them in the gumbo pot and tried to figure out what would best work for us. So I love to go ask questions and learn from others. So I would tell a young person that's trying to get in business, you need to go learn from other people's mistakes and you need to find as many people as you can to give you opinions, but then you've got to decide what's gonna work best for your area. You learn by going and asking others and try to get them to be truthful with what's good and what's bad. No one person is ever 100% right, but they all can give you input that's valuable. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that what I know about you. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
my knowledge of your company is very limited to what I see driving around the city of Lafayette. Uh, but I see that there's a Katie Gamblin security service. That's all that hanging on by Jason Bailey the other day. I don't know if you were involved in that decision directly, but can you maybe bring us, give us some background on how the decision was made? Did you recognize an inefficiency that you wanted to capitalize on? Just briefly what maybe that go no go decision was. So it's Acadian Total Security. So we had a lot of expense in backup communications in generators and batteries. So that the generator went out, the batteries kept all that stuff working. The more computers, the more radio circuits. We had a big infrastructure. So all of a sudden, we got into that business. Help, I'm falling and I can't get up. You press the pendant. It keeps people out of a nursing home for an extra year or two. We got into that was called Acadian on call, and we did that for about 10 years, and that thing grew really well. And then one of my people came and said, look, you got all this technology, you got the Acadian on call, why don't we expand our security system? And so we got into some additional video monitoring, burglar alarms, fire alarms, we became UL rated, and we've had substantial growth in that market while there is a lot of national competition. People seem to like having a local company monitor their system in this region. And so that's why we have popularity and that's why we've been able to grow that department. It's a, a very meaningful growth of the system. Uh, I don't see this thing being really big and expanding outside this area, but it's going to definitely expand in Louisiana and Texas. We're off to a great start with that. Uh, Blade Como, who has worked with me for 28 years, He's the president of that division, and he's done a wonderful job of expanding that program. Technology is changing very fast, and there is a great deal of competition in that area. However, we've gotten very good at the video part of it, and we're monitoring alarms now for the CIA and the FBI, certain prisons, as well as car, car dealerships up in the Boston area. And we're beginning to get some national accounts that we're actually monitoring here in Lafayette from all across the United States. So that division has grown, and now we have the retail division where we finally started installing systems ourselves, and that's had great success. The diversity is good for us. We like having diversified operations. That was going to be my exact question. So, so, okay, okay, all right, all right. Pardon? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about technology and how you see the company changing the next 10, 20 years with technology that's coming on board now, whether it's the use of drones or whether it's other things that you see coming down the pipeline? Well, you know, people problems are time consuming. <laughs> Uh, you know, 50% of the budget is labor, so you spend a lot of time working. And we have good people, but still people problems can take a lot of time because you can have the best workforce, but there's always problems that we have in society that you have to deal with. Um, the technology is causing me a little bit of a heartache because it's changing too fast. I want it to last for a longer period of time. It's costing a little too much capital. We're not going to be able to keep up with all the technology advancements because it's cost prohibitive now. I mean, it used to be that a computer could last three, four, five years. Now you, it's outdated in a year. Te technology is just moving in a very quick process. So, you know, one of the things <laughs> that, uh, that, that I talked about was, uh, okay, we have uh, a medic in the back and the ambulance drives itself. The, the problem that I was telling somebody the other day, what happens when the satellites and GPS are running all these cars and the terrorists knock out the link and it all shuts off and they all have a wreck at one time? How am I going to have enough ambulances to get to everybody? It's a stupid question because when they shut the thing off, everybody's going to just stop. But I'm, I'm sure that people will cause problems. I think some of the future terrorist problems will be on the internet. And I think it's coming faster than what we realize. I went to a big symposium in New York City two weeks ago, and I was frightened by some of the things I heard. And I think all of us have been hearing here in Lafayette that we're now being exposed to more and more people breaking in to the internet system and getting into our system 
and holding hostages and stealing money and other things. So I think that's going to be one of the big problems we're going to have to address going forward. Technology has made our lives a lot simpler, but in some cases it's also made it more complicated. I think we're trying to digest too much information. I think there's too much information flowing in and we can't process it all, both at work and personally. And uh, it bothers me a little bit that in some cases our kids are learning how to communicate on the phones and the email and the apps and not learning how to personally communicate with each other. And I think sometimes internally in my company that we think by sending out emails we can get everybody to be compliant. But it takes some coaching and some explaining and some one on one time, even if it's just by phone or by FaceTime or something like that. We're not good communicators when we're trying to do it all in masses. It, it takes the personal touch and that's something I'm trying to get our people to have a better understanding of. So I have mixed thoughts about technology. It's really made life easier in many ways because I'm not sitting on the floor sorting 10,000 cards. The computer does that now. But there's other problems that technology is bringing us. Do you see a day where you might have a self-driving ambulance? Yes. I really do see that day. More so for the non-emergency, not so much for the emergency, but for the non-emergency. Uh, I, I'm concerned about some of the things I'm seeing with Uber type apps out in California where they're using that type of technology for non-emergency ambulances. That could have an effect on us in the metropolitan areas that we serve, but maybe not in the rural areas. See, one of the things that's different about our company, in the 38 parishes that we're in Louisiana, there's six of them that break even that we wouldn't be in if we weren't in the hub. Like if we weren't in Alexandria, we wouldn't be in Grant Parish. We're the kind of company that wants to do the right thing. And government sees that. Many private companies want to have okay patient care, but they want to have maximum bottom line. We're not just driven by bottom line. That's important. We're driven by service and patient care. And that makes our company somewhat different than other private ambulance companies. We also allow the local government to regulate our rates and our time responses, and we comply and allow them to measure that to make sure that we're providing the kind of service that we say we are. That's an important component for us. We took a survey eight years ago, and there was a lot of people in this area that thought we were a nonprofit organization owned by the police juries in the cities. It was amazing. I can remember. Red Dumas deal when we were having trouble financially in the late 80s when I didn't make that payroll, brought all the police street presidents in and all the mayors and said, now listen here, this is a private company that's operating more like a nonprofit because they ain't making any money and they're not paying their bank note. And if you don't let them raise their membership from $18 to 24, I'm pulling the plug, they're out of business and you're gonna have to take it all over again. <laughs> you should have seen the look on those people's faces, and that's how I got my 33% rate increase. If that hadn't happened, we might have got out of business. So um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I want to make a, a few thank yous, uh, as we do. Uh, first of all, I do want to, I don't know if the team is still here, uh, at least uh, we've got one person, but uh, I want to thank uh, the team at Rafino's. Uh, for opening up early for us, for serving us the delicious food. Uh, be sure to thank them uh, on the way out. Uh, secondly, J.D., I want to thank you and the Cane River Pecan Company for, uh, for supporting this series uh, so generously and so passionately. Uh, I want to acknowledge also that uh, Richard Zuschlag and Acadian Companies uh, has not only played, uh, obviously, a, a significant role uh, in this economy in general, but uh, uh, played a very significant role in the creation of One Acadiana. Uh, and Richard personally has had a big influence on me. Uh, we're now an organization that's a few years old and it's working pretty well. Uh, but when we embarked on this vision, uh, there were a lot of folks who uh, didn't quite get it at first. Um, we talked about going from a small Lafayette chamber to uh, a nine parish regional organization with a much more 
uh, significant scope of work focused on uh, some of the big issues that business leaders cared about. And it, it involved a, a lot more leadership from guys like Richard, uh, and frankly, it involved a lot more money to get the thing off the ground. And um, uh, there were uh, a period of months where I wasn't sure if we were going to be successful in uh, making that transformation. And one of the things that gave me confidence and encouragement uh, in, those, uh, in those days uh, and in those sleepless nights was that uh, in my conversations with Richard Zuschlag, he was one of the first people to uh, not only embrace the vision, uh, but to say yes to it. And I will be grateful forever for that, Richard. Um, I also want to um, thank, thank your team. Um, in addition to, to Richard's leadership, uh, I can't think of a company uh, in Acadiana where you've got uh, uh, the force multiplier across the entire uh, organizational family um, in terms of its community impact as Acadian companies. Uh, a number of them have served on our board and committee. Um, they've become personal friends. Uh, they support events like this by showing up generously uh, and enthusiastically. By the way, uh, One Acadiana is a user of uh, Acadian Total Security. It's awesome. The guys are here. Um, so be sure, to, be sure to check them out on the way out. Um, and, and finally, uh, not only um, do I want to thank you, Richard, for sharing uh, the lessons from the corner office as chairman and uh, CEO of Acadian companies, but also um, the lessons of being Dr. Zero Zero. Uh, of being uh, of being DJ Dick Richards. Um, if if y'all enjoyed uh, this conversation as much as I did, please put your hands together and thank Richard. Yeah.